things I think it's important for ministers to do is talk to about us about why we do the things we do and how we do them and to ask questions about them so that we come, come to a fuller understanding of what it is we're doing and saying. And so with the Lord's Prayer, I think most of us say it by rote. We just know it, we say it, and we run right past it, right? Now, if we're Catholic, we may stop because we're praying the rosary so you don't get to just run right by it because the next bead will make you say it again. Or I think it's the big beads, right? You say the other prayers in between and you get to the big P and you say the Our Father. So you, you say it more than once, so maybe by the third or fourth time you're actually hearing the words that you're saying. But most of us just run right through it. And when you guys are on your own devices, you say it so fast that I don't even think you know the words that you've said that come out of your mouth. And that's why I think it's important to stop sometimes and remember why we say the things we say and to ask questions about it. <coughs> so we're going to take it, and I normally don't do this. We're going to do it line by line. And in this case, this week, we're going to go word by word or phrase by phrase. And is that okay to do? So I'm going to answer that question by giving you the first line that was read today. Then he said, pray this way. Then he said, pray in this manner. Then he said, pray like this. He didn't say, literally only say these words this way, right? He said, pray in this manner. Meaning he was trying to teach you that when you turn to God and ask and pray, here is a form, a manner, a means by which you can do so. And if you want to know if it's okay for it to change, if you read the weekly email this week, it tells you that there are three versions of the Lord's Prayer in the early church. The Luke version says, Father in heaven. The Matthew version says, Our Father who art in heaven. The Didache is the one we pray. So meaning that the Didache is the confirmation booklet that they gave people. It's the course you went through in order to be baptized in the early church. And in that, it gave you the version of the Lord's Prayer that we say today. And we say in Protestant churches because it has debts. And that version, they say after you've learned it, we want you to pray it three times a day. So how many of you only say it on Sunday? You don't have to answer. <laughs> but what if you took it seriously and said it more often? What if you used your rosary daily and said it? What if you took the dedicate seriously and said it three times a day, morning, noon, and night? What if you said it when you're troubled or struggling? Would that start to change how you feel and how you experience the prayer? So if Jesus didn't say this is how you have to pray it, but said, this is the manner in which you can pray. <clears throat> that changes how we can look at the words. So I will tell you, as a young, fresh out of seminary person, I was like, we don't need to say the our father part of it, because it's so disrespectful to women. It leaves us completely out of the holy. Well, my advice is never change it in a church because it doesn't go well. But we need to talk about why we say things. So the very first word is our. What does that mean to you? Our. Not my father. Not me, I. But our. Who is that 
hour we're praying to? Who are we praying with? Who is the group that we are calling on to be with us as we pray? Have you ever thought to ask that question when you say that first word? Our. Are you praying within with the community that you have chosen to worship with? Are you praying with the community of all Christians around the world? Are you praying with your family and those who have come before, your ancestors that are still there with you, when you say our, does it include them? Who is that community that is included in the hour? But that changes it, right? Because if it's not our father, but my father, my father makes it about me, right? It makes it a prayer that is directed to me, to my God, versus a prayer that goes beyond to all, to everyone. It invites an opening to the world, our Father. Father. So this is the most problematic word in the entire prayer for a whole lot of people. So what do we do with that word, Father? How do we talk about that word? Because Father can be problematic for a whole bunch of reasons. So for me, as a teenager, when I learned that you didn't have to say all male pronouns about God all the time, that you could speak about God in language that was not all male-centered, it changed my understanding of who God could be. It welcomed me into a faith that I had not felt welcome in. Because the people we were worshiping with when I was a teenager believed, in contradiction to what my parents were telling me, believed that I should grow up to be a wife and mother. And while I wanted to be a wife and mother, I had other dreams. I had big plans about going places and seeing the world. I had plans about what I could study. And then I learned that I just liked to study. But I had dreams. And when we said that our father, that father part, put me in that place where I wasn't included because my dreams weren't listened to. And that idea of struggling with that question of who is the father and what does father mean is important for us to ask. Because there are people who struggle with that word for a variety of reasons. So in my last congregation, I had a person who was very firmly in the inclusive language camp. And so we learned in the church, because I do this in every church, to pause between phrases, because some people are gonna say trespasses and that just takes longer. But some people have to add to the word father, have to add another phrase there that makes them feel welcome and comfortable. And so the pause at the our father is to let people express who they are directing the prayer to. And why do people struggle with that word? Some people struggle with it because of the maleness of the word. Some people struggle with it because their relationship with a real father has not been good. That their relationship has been always a struggle and a battle and they don't feel safe with a God who is called Father because they never felt safe with their own Father. And some people, when they say that word, have wonderful images of loving fathers who are there for them, have protected them, have helped them grow, have taken them to practice and cheered on the sidelines even when the ball never came to them who were there for them in all the moments. And so for them, that word father feels good. But is the word father the only way we could say that? Our father. 
What if we talked about the ways God goes beyond that word, Father? What if we talk about the images within the scripture that call God mother? There's a psalm that says God gathers us under her wings like a mother bird. What if we talked about Father in a way that opened it up to make everyone feel comfortable? So why did Jesus choose the word Father? That is mostly an unknown, but here's my take on it, okay? Jesus chose the word Father because he was challenging the religious understanding of the day. And in the religious understanding of the day, there was the Roman understanding where the gods just messed with your lives, randomly did stuff, and were very absent. Like, they would just appear and cause horrible havoc. But the rest of the time, they were removed from you. In the Jewish tradition at the time, there had grown up this understanding in some parts of it that God had to be mediated in the temple through the priest. That you didn't have a direct relationship with God. That you moved your relationship through the temple and through the priest to get in contact with God. And so when Jesus says, our Father, he's taking God that has been set apart and is only allowed to be contacted by special ordained people and saying, all of you, all of you, you slaves, you tradesmen, you poor fishermen, you left out and outcast, you who have been discarded by society, you are invited into a relationship with God. You are invited to have a direct relationship with God, a relationship with God that is immediate and real, that you don't have to have somebody in between you and God. And so Jesus chose the word Father to make it personal, to make it intimate, to remind us that God, our Father, is not far off, but is present with all that we go through, is there for those moments when we're struggling, is there in those moments when we are grieving and sick? Is there in those moments when we are celebrating that God is present in all of the moments? Our Father, who art in heaven. So when you hear that phrase, what do you think? So we in our society have been trained to think, and this is a new training, okay? To think of heaven as that place where God dwells, right? Which would be different from what Jesus is arguing in the Father, which is bringing it back to be personal. So what is Jesus trying to get at when he says, who art in heaven? So in the Gospel of Matthew, When Jesus says the kingdom of God, Jesus doesn't talk in those words. The Gospel of Matthew calls it the kingdom of heaven. It's one of the quirks. Like in the other Gospels, it'll be kingdom of God. In Matthew, it's the kingdom of heaven. The same concept. In John, it's eternal life. That idea that, that there is heaven among us. And that we are called to participate in that building of the kingdom of heaven. For how does Jesus describe it in the Gospel of Matthew? Jesus says, there was a seed that when planted in the ground was watered. And that seed was so small and so tiny. But with that care, with that tending, with that effort that was put in to grow that seed, it blossomed and grew into a giant bush that sheltered the birds in the area. 
The kingdom of heaven is like a tiny sea. The kingdom of heaven is like the woman who on that cold winter day has decided that baking bread would be an amazing thing. And so she takes the yeast. And she grows that yeast and adds the flour and soon has the dough that she puts in the oven that grows into a loaf of bread. The kingdom of heaven is like that tiny, invisible, almost yeast that when worked grows into something wonderful and warm and inviting. The kingdom of heaven is like a pearl. It's beautiful beyond imagining. It's wanted and needed. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that has been lost in the field and when found, brightens your life. The kingdom of heaven is something that Jesus calls us to take the small and grow it into something big. The kingdom of heaven is to remind us that God is present with us, is here with us, growing in us, transforming us, and helping us to spread that message that God is always there, that God loves you beyond imagining that there's a loaf of bread for you, that's a tree to shade you in the heat of the day, that there's a pearl of wisdom to guide you. Our Father who art in heaven, mm -hmm. hallowed be thy name. So the new version of it is the one from, they revised the Bibles that we have in our queue to the new updated version. And the new updated version says, pray it in this way, our Father in heaven, may your name be revered as holy. I don't know if I like that version, but I thought you should know what some new translations are saying. Because one of my favorite songs is Hallowed, um, that, that sings the Lord's Prayer, and the focus of the ver her singing is Hallowed. So how do we talk about the holy? What do we just see and feel and experience as holy? Is the holy something that is there, already present, and we just have to discover it? Is it made holy because year after year, people have been in this space praying, worshiping, celebrating, singing, calling on God, and does the holy then inhabit this space because we open our eyes and can see God the Holy. Hallowed be thy name. So here's the interesting part, right? So we normally think, oh, that means our Father, Father, the name. But Father is a designation, right? Like grandfather, mother. It's, it's a title, not the name. So the prayer says, hallowed be thy name without naming the name. So why? Why would Jesus say your name is holy and then not give a name? Because he's Jewish. And in Judaism, you don't say the name of God, the tetragram. You have it symbolically represented in the text, but in, in most versions of our Bible, it's replaced, right? But Jesus could have chose a name for God. He could have chose the Almighty Lord. Jesus could have chose to put in the tetragram here. But maybe Jesus was asking us to look at that line and think about God. Think about who God is and who God isn't. To remember that God is beyond name, right? To remind you 
that when God gave God's own name to the Jewish people, God said to Moses in the burning bush, I am who I am. Not an answer, right? Because that doesn't define God. God knows who God is, but it doesn't tell us who God is. It says, I am who I am. Now, current rabbis tend to translate it as, I will be who I will be. That God is the ultimate mystery. That just when we think we know who God is, have an understanding, God breaks open that box and frees. Freeze that understanding, messes with it, and says, there is more that you just didn't understand at this moment. And so Jesus doesn't give God a name because Jesus is reminding us of that tradition that God is the holy mystery at the heart of the universe, that God is always beyond what we know, that we have all those stories in the Bible all those stories, because each story gives us a different image, a different understanding, a different picture of a part of who God is. And each of those images together give us a more complete whole, a more understanding of who God is, but none of them is complete. And it opens us up to the possibility that even now, even 2,000 years later, after Jesus gave us these words, that our understanding of who God is can always be pushed and pulled and, and transformed because God is beyond any name that we can think of together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This week, I invite you to sit with us. Try different things. Put in different names. Instead of Father, think about Mother, Beloved, Creator. What name, what title, what feeling do you want in that spot? When you get to the part about heaven, Think about what that means to you. What would heaven on earth look like to you? How would you experience it? And then just rest there with God. The God that is mysterious and unknown and known, that we have glimpses and pictures of, and we know that we don't know everything we can know. This week, I invite you to sit with those words, to let them change you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Amen.